I want to ask Brother Tony Walker. Brother Tony, you come on around and be our kickoff preacher tonight. Amen. And uh, Sister Kim Phillips, wherever Kim's at, we'll have her sing right after Tony. We're going to give these guys, I hate to limit anybody, but with nine of them, I'm not even going to preach unless we really reel up with a, with a gap of some time we weren't planning on. And I'm going to do my best to accommodate all these young guys. So give them your attention and let's encourage them all. Brother Tony, my son in the ministry. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Real. You speak English. Give the cameraman. Can't see who it is, but give him a break tonight. If you just want to zoom out where you got enough right here. You ain't got to follow me around, but that's all right. Bless you, Lord. Like preacher Sam Allen said one time, some preachers preach for him. They stand there and hardly move, and then he preaches, and they say it's like watching a tennis match back and forth. But the Apostle Paul said in uh, Philippians chapter 1, he said, no matter how, how Christ is preached, as long as it's Christ being preached, he yeah. said he would rejoice. Uh, we're, the devil tries to do a lot of stuff to us. Um, I'm not as spiritual as I'd like to be and not as spiritual as I pretend to be. Uh, but the, my biggest problem, I'd have to say, is my flesh. A lot of people say the, the, the devil, the world, and the flesh, but I'd put them in the other order, the flesh, the world, and the devil. Apostle Paul said his greatest enemy uh, was himself. He said, inside me that is my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Jesus told a group of people one time, he said that they were a whited sepulcher, a, a whited grave. It looked good on the outside, kind of like a coffin, kind of like what uh, James Brown was laid, uh, the Godfather soul laid in this week. Uh, but all the money he had isn't doing him any good right now. All the good things, all the charities, all that stuff won't do him a bit of good. I don't know his testimony. I don't know if he's saved or not. But I know this. Every person who leaves this world lost, no matter how pretty that coffin may be, it won't do them a bit of good. So it's real easy to sometimes to focus on the outwards. It's real easy to sometimes to focus on the, the external things and, and lose touch of what really matters. But we're going to look at four things tonight that I hope will be a blessing that should show four different areas in the Bible, four different scriptures to teach us to look at what is most important. You alluded to it this morning uh, when Samuel went down to Jesse and he, he looked and that kind of helped me uh, know what to preach tonight. And Samuel went down to Jesse and he, he, said, uh, he said, do you have the sons? And he showed them all the sons. And he went to the first one, and he could do this and that. Uh, but the, the point of that in 1 Samuel chapter 16 is it said that man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. God looks on the inside. Now, that doesn't change the fact that, yes, man does look on the outside. So, yes, we should have an external public testimony for the sake of a witness and for the sake of Christ. But the important thing is what God sees on the inside. Uh, but in Genesis chapter 6, y'all, most of you know it, uh, is the story about Noah's ark and the flood in chapter 7, chapter 8, and chapter 9. God makes a covenant with Noah. But in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 14, it says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And, the door of the, and of the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower, second, third stories shalt thou make it. So we see that this ark, God gave the commandments to make it 300 by 300 by 50 by 30 as far as cubits go. So it's a, a rectangular shape. Uh, it's, a, it's a big rectangular box. It's got three stories, three levels. And what is it made out of? It says that it's an ark of gopher wood. 
and is sealed within and without with pitch. It looked like a real modest log cabin, looked like a real modest uh, uh, log home. Uh, you got some woods, some boards built, some wood built, and you know what holds it together? Not cement, not stucco, uh, not the latest designer trends at Home Depot, but just simple pitch. Something from a tree, something from coal, or whatever the case may be. It, the point is this, it wasn't very appealing to the eyes. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and he preached that God was going to send a judgment, God was going to send, uh, judge the world and send a flood to, to take care of all the ungodliness. And what did Noah do? He preached, by, he preached and then he built the ark. And you know how many people got on the ark with him? Just a few people. The Bible says eight souls were saved in the day of Noah. It wasn't very appealing to look at. It didn't look like one of the, those ships out in the sea where the jets take off. When you looked at it, it's just some, some modest wood and some modest pitch holding it all together. But the point is this. It wasn't what it looked like on the outside. It's what was on the inside. If you look in chapter 7 and verse 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. And then if you flip over to chapter 8 and verse 16, God speaking again, or Genesis 8, 15, And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. The point of that is this. When, Noah wanted, when God wanted Noah to get into the ark, he said, Come into the ark. God didn't say, Noah, go into the ark. But he said, Noah, come into the ark. And then when he wanted Noah to get out of the ark, he didn't say, Noah, come out. But he said, Noah, go out. The point of that is this, why I said that. God was in the ark the whole time. So even though it may not look good on the outside, even though the appearance may not be what all the world wanted to see, the important thing is this. It wasn't what it looked like on the outside. Yes, it was effective. Yes, it, it was pitched within, went without with pitch. The water couldn't get in. The animals couldn't get out. They were safe and secure. But God was with Noah the whole time. And I'd say that that speaks of our home. That speaks of our protection. You know, some people in here might have a nice home, real three, four hundred, four, four, five hundred thousand homes. There's a few of those around in Anderson. But even if you don't have that, even if it may not look good on the outside, if that's what God's given you, don't look on the outside, but look at what's on the inside. Is God in the midst of there? That was their home. If you look at the look at how long they were in that ark for a for a bunch of days, that was their home. They didn't go out of it. Now, Noah couldn't control what happened outside of that ark. He left that up to God. If there's sin, if there's ungodliness, if there's wickedness, Noah had no control about what took place outside the ark. But as long as it was inside of the ark, and as long as he was there, the head of the home, and God was there looking, over th looking at everything and taking care of everything, that shows the importance that inside of Noah's little home, with his family in there, God was there, and that's what makes it special. You know, I know when you speak a house in the Bible, it can refer to a family, but you know what it says about Hebrews in chapter 11? By faith, Noah built an ark to the saving of his house. So in, I'd say that Genesis chapter 6, we can call it a picture of our home. It may not be the most beautiful thing. may not be the most elaborate thing. It may not draw people. It may not attract people. But if God is there in the midst, then that's all that counts. So when the devil flip, if you want to flip to the next point, we'll be in the book of Exodus chapter 26. So when the, devil, the flesh, the world, the devil gets you looking at so-and-so lives up here, so-and-so moved up there, so-and-so bought this or built this, that may be nice, and if God allows them to do that, then rejoice with those that rejoice. But the important thing is look at what's on the inside. If it was a, a master ship and God wasn't on the inside, that thing would have sunk, and they would all perish. But by faith, Noah built an ark to the saving of his house. So I, I would say that one area, our flesh and the world and the devil, tries to get us to focus on everyone else, I'd, I'd say that's our home. You go through and drive down the road and say, boy, I wish I had this, or boy, I wish I had that. When we ought to look at what we do have and realize that as long as God's there in the middle of it, then that's all that matters. Well, another area that, that the world, the flesh, the devil tries to get us to think about and doubt and, and look other places instead of looking at what he's already blessed us with, I'd say is our place of worship. So first of all, it happens with the, where we live, our home, uh, where God has given us to protect us and watch over us. I'd say that also happens in the place of worship. In Exodus chapter 26... If you look in verse 1, it says, Moreover, thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine entwined linen, and blue and purple and scarlet, with cherubims of cunning work shalt thou make them. 
And then in verse 7, And thou shalt make curtains of goat hair to be a covering upon the tabernacle. Eleven curtains shalt thou make. And then if you look on down to verse 14, And thou shalt make a covering for the tent of rams, skins dyed red, and a covering above of badger skins. Now there's a lot, a bunch of chapters in the book of Exodus, and then in, in also Le- Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, it speaks about the tabernacle. But first of all, we've seen that it's real easy to, to look outward and look on the outward things as far as a home, but when the important thing is what's on the inside. Next, I want us to see that the important thing about our place of worship is not what it looks like on the outside, but about who dwells on the inside in the midst. You see that on the inside, it was made out of fine twine linen. It had blue and purple and scarlet, blue representing heaven, purple royalty, and scarlet, the color of sacrifice. And you got pure white linen, which is a picture of Christ. It's perfect. It's pure. There's no spots. There's no blemish in it. But let me remind you, you didn't see that from the outside when the children of Israel were there and they were looking inward at the tabernacle you saw the linen from the outside you saw the the blue and the scarlet and the purple on the outside but if you look down in verse 14 it says and thou shalt make a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red and a covering above of badger skins now let me ask you this do any of you uh, would you want to come down here to this church and see badger skins hanging all on the outside no you will see something looks nice and attractive the point is this badger skins skins aren't the most attractive thing. Ram skins dyed red isn't the most attractive thing. Goat hair is not the most attractive thing. But God didn't want Israel to be looking on the outside of the tabernacle, but he wanted them to be focused, go into the door, go into the curtain, go into the holy place. As a matter of fact, once a year, not without blood, the high priest would go back into the most holy place, and that's what God wanted Israel's attention focused on. Just a little, little coffin-shaped box covered with gold, made out of wood, covered with gold, two little cherubs, but inside that little mist, God, the invisible, uh, unchangeable, eternal God that inhabits heaven, heaven can't even uh, contain him, come to this world and there somehow, some way, hovered in a cloud. If you flip to the end of Exodus, it'll show us a few things to show us how important that, that is. Exodus chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40 and verse 34. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So we see right here that when the... the the tabernacle was the center of Israel. It was what they, what they were surrounded around. They, they, they didn't wander over here and leave the tabernacle. They, they kept it there. That was the center of their life. That was the center of their religion, the center of their worship. Noah, he may not have had a pretty house to live in, but it kept him from the destruction and the influences of the outside world. And when we come to our place of worship, it's really easy to look up here and look what they build or look what they build or, or look how they sing or look how they preach. And there, there's people, and they can put on a good show and a good performance, and, and some of them may be truly serving the Lord. But if we look on the outward appearance, if we look at the building and don't look at what takes place on the inside, then that we miss the whole point. With, it didn't matter how elaborate it was, was on the outside what mattered is what was on the inside and God's presence God's manifestation of himself was there in the middle on the outside it may have been goat hair and ram skin dyed red and badger skin not very attractive and not very pretty wouldn't build a wouldn't gather a whole large number today but God wanted Israel not to look on the outside not to point over there and say hey look that that's where I worship at but he wanted them to point that high priest he goes into that holy place and that's where my sins are paid for they're not paid for by the goat hair and the badger skin on the outside they're paid for by the blood that was sprinkled on the mercy seat there in the middle so When we think about our home, it's easy sometimes to look what everybody else has and forget that as long as God's there on the inside, that's all that counts. It's easy to look at churches and what they're building, what they're doing, how large they're going, and say, well, boy, I wish I had that or wish I had this. When, you know, the Egyptians, they had those big old pyramids, but God wasn't in the middle of those pyramids. The other, the... 
worshipers, they built Stonehenge, and they still can't explain how they built Stonehenge, but God was nowhere near that. But in a little old humble tabernacle, just a few hundred feet by a few hundred feet, the Egyptians had their big old pyramids, the Stonehenge builders somehow got those big old stones, and they worshiped the stars. But a small group of people, just like that, but that one day be as numbers the sand of the sea and the stars in the sky, in a little old humble place inside of some badger skin and some goat hair, the God of eternity, the God of heaven, manifest himself. May not look good on the outside, but the inside is what counts. Turn now to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. So if you're like me, and everybody is, like Preacher Sam mentioned this morning, we're all made out of body of flesh, can't deny that. It's easy to look at other people's homes and look at what they got and forget what's on the inside of our home. It's easy to look at other people's churches and say, boy, they got this and that and they're doing this and that when God's not in the midst of it. God's not in the center of it. But if we've got God in the middle of our homes, if we've got God in the middle of our church, we've got a lot to be thankful for. Well, another area that the devil will try to get us men with is our wives. You wives who might get, try and get you with your husband say, look, look at so-and-so wives over there. Don't, don't you wish you had them? Or, or so-and-so's husband say, boy, I, they, they can do this, that. They do this for their spouse and this for their spouse. They can take them on trips. They can do this for them. Uh, just as with our home and our church, a lot of times the world, flesh, and devil tries to get us to, to focus on other people's spouses. It says in Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10, Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. And you can read all of Proverbs chapter 31 when you get time, but if most of you have read it. You know that that's talking about the virtuous woman. Look at verse 27. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. All of the, quali all of the qualifications, all the descriptions, all the good things it says about this woman right here, if you go back and look at it, it talks about the things she wear, the silk and the scarlet, but if you go back and read it, it doesn't say one thing about her physical appearance. As a matter of fact, it goes as far as to say that favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But here's what's important. A woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. So let's remember that as far as our home is concerned, if God's there, that's all that matters. As far as our church is concerned, no matter what, what it looks like, what color the carpet is, whether we expand this way, this way, or build a new place as long as God's in the midst that's all that matters and no matter what our spouse may look like no matter how they how they may present themselves or how they may appear in front of other or people as far as attracting this or this or that if they have God in their heart that's all that matters let me read you a verse over in first Peter you, you can just stay right there but I'll I'll flip over and read you a verse out of first Peter chapter 3 you know it's real easy now, I'm not going to sound spiritual I'm a heterosexual male, and hopefully every other male in here is. Lanny told me one, something one time before I got married. He's, I was talking about how much I was attracted to my wife, and, and she's beautiful. And he said, just remember, when you get married, the devil's going to make you want to be attracted to other women. Um, and I, I would say that that's true. The biggest thing I deal with is not marijuana, cocaine, beer, or booze. But I'm a male. If, 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 a, if, a, if a, Listen, please. If a pretty blonde-headed woman goes walking around, you know what I have to do? I have to say, Holy Spirit, please help me to have a good, clean testimony. And so, you know, as, as beautiful as my wife may be, you know what the devil will do? He'll, he'll point to some, some trashy, no-good girl who, who may have pretty blonde hair and say, you know what, maybe if, if you weren't serving the Lord and preaching, you could have that. But you know what you get when you get something like that? The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 11, Forgot it. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 26, the Bible says, As a, as a jewel of gold and a swine's snout, so is a fair woman without discretion. You, you can have a beautiful, blonde-headed girl, and she's all over the news for being a tramp. You can have a woman who may present herself this way or that way, but inside she is the most wretched, vile woman that you've ever met in your life. Proverbs chapter 6 and Proverbs chapter 7 speaks of the adulterous woman. She, the man, the, the writer said he looked out of encasement, he looked out his window, and he saw a young man, a woman passing by on the corner, and she said, I've paid my religious vows, let us take our fill of loves into the morning. And it says by her mother,
much fair speech she caused him to yield. So you know what? I'm going to be attracted to my wife. Not because just because she's beautiful, not because she's got that pretty curly hair, not because she's a sweetheart, but because she knows the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior. So when we look at our home, if God's in the middle, that's all that counts. If we look at our church and our place of worship, if God's in the middle, that's all that counts. When we look at our wife or when we look at our husband or we look at our spouse, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, for the women not to be concerned with the plaiting of hair, the putting on of gold, the putting on of peril, but let it be the inward man of the heart. How can a woman have a man in her heart? Referring to Jesus Christ living in that wife's heart. I would rather have a saved wife than the most beautiful woman in this world because that's all that matters. One day this flesh will deteriorate. One day this hair will fall out. One day these eyes will diminish. One day those teeth will fall out and that woman will look. She'll return to the grave just as she came from the wound. Naked and not able to take a thing with her. But one thing that that person can take with them is the Lord Jesus Christ in their heart. I'll tell you one more, one more passage in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. The devil and everyone else will try to get us to look at so and so's house try to get us to look at so-and-so's church, trying to get us to look at so-and-so's wife, and then he'll try to hit you in the heart and say, look at that religion. They got this and that, and it looks so prim and proper, no blood, no this, no that. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 1, it says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Our Savior, the one who died on the cross, we shouldn't be attracted to our home because of what it looks like, but what's on the inside. We shouldn't be attracted to this church because of the way it's built or the way it's fashioned, but because of what takes place on the inside. We shouldn't be primarily attracted to our spouse because of what's on the outside, but because of who lives on the inside. And the one who died on the cross, we're not attracted to him because he was muscular. We're not attracted to him because he had blonde hair, or blue eyes, or green eyes, or brown hair. We're not attracted to him because any physical thing about him, but because of who he was on the inside. And let me remind you that on the inside, he was wasn't just a good man. On the inside, he wasn't just a good teacher. But the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, In him, in Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. When you look at the birth of Jesus Christ, it was just a humble, meek birth. Nothing attractive about that. When you look at the way he died on the cross, there was nothing attractive about that. When you look at his ministry, he didn't even have a place to lay his head. The animals could go to sleep in their dens, but he said, The Son of Man hath not a place to lay his head. When you look at the fact that he was ministered to by the women, and they gave him everything to, to keep along on his journeys, his food and this and that. There was nothing physically attractive about Jesus Christ. But you know what it has enabled him to attract thousands and millions of people down through, etern down through thousands of years? Not for who he was on the outside, but because on the inside, the fullness of God dwelt inside of that one man, the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, I'll remind you the verse I said a few minutes ago when I began. God said that man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. When you go home tonight, it doesn't matter if the shutter's falling off, the door doesn't close. If God's there, that's all that counts. Next time, when we show up next, next Wednesday or Sunday or whenever that may be, when you walk in the doors, don't look at this or that or the bathroom or the door. Look at what takes place when the preaching of God's words goes on. When you go home and you look at that wife or that husband in the eyes, if you see maybe they got a wrinkle here or a gray hair there, don't look at that. Look at who lives on the inside. And when you look at your Savior, Jesus Christ, don't be concerned about how tall he was or how short he was or, or how big or little he was. Be concerned with the fact that on the inside, he was God manifest in the flesh.